The Man Who Never Told a Lie by Isaac Asimov. When Roger Halstead made his appearance at the head of the stairs on the day of the monthly meeting of the Black Widowers, the only others yet present were Avalon, the patent attorney, and Reuben, the writer. They greeted him with jubilation. Emmanuel Reuben said, Well, you finally managed to stir yourself up to the point of meeting your old friends, have you? He trotted over and held out both his hands, his straggly beard stretching to match his grin. Where have you been the last two meetings? Hello, Roger, said Geoffrey Avalon, smiling from his stiff height. Halstead shocked his coat. Damned cold outside, Henry, bring... Uh, Henry, the only waiter the Black Widows ever had, or ever would have, already had the drink waiting. I'm glad to see you again, sir. Halstead took it with a nod of thanks. Twice running, something came up. Say, you know what I've decided to do? Give up mathematics and make an honest living, asked Reuben. Halstead sighed. Teaching math at a junior high school is as honest a living as one can find. That's why it pays so little. In that case, said Avalon, swirling his drink gently, why is freelance writing so dishonest a racket? Freelance writing is not dishonest, said freelance Reuben, rising to the bait at once. What have you decided to do, Roger? asked Avalon. It's this project I've dreamed up, said Halstead. His forehead rose white and high, showing no signs of the hairline that had been there perhaps ten years ago, though the hair was still copious enough around the sides and in the back. I'm going to rewrite the Iliad and the Odyssey in limericks, one for each of the forty-eight books they contain. Avalon nodded. Any of it written? I've got the first book of the Iliad taken care of. It goes like this. Agamemnon, the top-ranking Greek, to Achilles in anger did speak. They argued a lot, then Achilles grew hot and went stamping away in a peak. Not bad, said Avalon. In fact, quite good. It gets across the essence of the first book in full. Of course, the proper name of the hero of the Iliad is Achilles, with a CH sound as in, that would throw off the meter, said Halstead. Besides, said Reuben, everyone would think the U was a typographical error, and that's all they'd see in the limerick. Mario Gonzalo, the artist, came racing up the stairs. He was host for this session, and he said, Anyone else here? Nobody here but us old folks, said Avalon. My guest is on his way up, real interesting guy. Henry will like him because he never tells a lie. Henry lifted an eyebrow as he produced Mario's drink. Don't tell me you're bringing the ghost to George Washington, said Halstead. Roger, a pleasure to see you again. By the way, Jim Drake won't be here with us today. He sent back the card saying there was some family shindig he had to attend. The guest I'm bringing is a fellow named Sand, John Sand. I've known him on and off for years. Real crazy guy. Horse race buff who never tells a lie. I've heard him not telling lies. That's the only virtue he has. And Gonzalo winked. Avalon nodded. Good for those who can as one grows older, however. And I think it will be an interesting session, added Gonzalo hurriedly, visibly avoiding one of Avalon's long-winded confidences. I was telling him about the Black Widower's Club and how the last two times we had mysteries on our hands. Mysteries? said Halstead with sudden interest. Gonzalo said, You're a member of the club in good standing, so we can tell you. But get Henry to do it. He was a principal both times. Henry? Halstead looked over his shoulder in mild surprise. Are they getting you involved in their idiocies? I assure you, Mr. Halstead, I tried not to be, said Henry. Tried not to be, exclaimed Reuben. Listen, Henry was the Sherlock of the session last time. He... The point is, said Avalon, that you may have talked too much, Mario. What did you tell your friend about us? What do you mean, talk too much? I'm not Manny Rubin, you know. I carefully told San that we were priests at the confessional one and all, as far as anything in this room is concerned, and he said he wished he were a member because he has a difficulty that's been driving him wild, and I said he could come the next time because it was my turn to be host, and he could be my guest, and here he is. A slim man, his neck swathed in a thick scarf, was mounting the stairs. The slimness was emphasized when he took off his coat. 
Under the scarf, his tie gleamed blood red and seemed to lend color to a thin and pallid face. He was thirtyish. John Sand, said Mario, introducing him all round in a pageant that was interrupted by Thomas Tumble's heavy tread on the steps and the code expert's loud cry of, Henry, a scotch and soda for a dying man. Reuben said, Tom, you could be here early if only you'd relax and stop trying so hard to be late. Later I come, said Trumbull, the less I have to hear of your stupid remarks. Ever think of that? Then he was introduced to, and they all sat down. Since the menu for that meeting had been so incautiously planned as to begin with artichokes, Reuben launched into a dissertation on the preparation of the only proper sauce. Then when Trumbull said disgustedly that the only proper preparation for artichokes involved a large garbage can, Reuben said, sure, if you don't have exactly the right sauce. Sand ate uneasily and left at least one-third of his excellent steak untouched. Halstead, who had a tendency to plumpness, eyed the remains enviously. His own plate was the first one to be cleaned. Only a scraped bone and some fat were left. Sand seemed to grow aware of Halstead's eyes and said, Frankly, I'm too worried to have much appetite. Would you care for the rest of my steak? Me? No, thank you, said Halstead glumly. Sand smiled. May I be frank? Of course. If you've been listening to the conversation around the table, you'll realize frankness is the order of the day. Good, because I would be anyway. It's my fetish. You're lying, Mr. Halstead. Of course you want the rest of my steak, and you'd eat it, too, if you thought no one would notice. That's perfectly obvious. But social convention requires you to lie. You don't want to seem greedy. You don't want to seem to ignore the elements of hygiene by eating something possibly contaminated by the saliva of a stranger. Halstead frowned. And what if the situation were reversed? And I was hungry for more steak? Yes. Well, I might not want to eat yours for hygienic reasons, but I would admit I wanted it. Almost all lying is the result of a desire for self-protection or out of respect for social conventions. To me, however, a lie is rarely a useful defense, and I am not at all interested in social conventions. Reuben said, actually, a lie is a useful defense if it is a thoroughgoing one. The trouble with most lies is that they don't go far enough. Been reading Mein Kampf lately? said Gonzalo. Reuben's eyebrows went up. You think Hitler was the first to use the technique of the big lie? You can go back to Napoleon III. We can go back to Julius Caesar. Have you ever read his commentaries? Henry was bringing the Babao room and pouring the coffee delicately when Avalon said, Let's get to our honored guest. Gonzalo said, As host and chairman of this session, I'm going to cancel the grilling. Our guest has a problem, and I direct him to favor us with its details. He was drawing a quick caricature of sand on the back of the menu card, with a thin, sad face accentuated into the face of a distorted bloodhound. Sand cleared his throat. I understand everything said in this room is in the strictest confidence, but, um... Trumbull followed Sand's glance, then growled, Don't worry about Henry. He is the best of us all. If you want to doubt someone's discretion, doubt someone else. Thank you, sir, murmured Henry, setting up the brandy glasses on the sideboard. Sand said, The trouble, gentlemen, is that I am suspected of a crime. What kind of crime? demanded Trumbull. It was his duty, ordinarily, to grill the guests, and the look in his eye was that of a person who had no intention of missing his opportunity. Theft, said Sand. There is a sum of money in a wad of negotiable bonds missing from a safe in my company. I'm one of those who know the combination, and I've had a chance to open the safe unobserved. I also have a motive. I've had bad luck at the races and needed cash urgently, so it doesn't look good for me. Gonzalo said eagerly, But he didn't do it. That's the point. He didn't do it. Avalon twirled the half-drink he was not going to finish and said, I think in the interest of coherence, we ought to allow Mr. Sand to tell his story. Yes, said Trumbull. How do you know he didn't do it, Mario? That's the whole point, damn it. He says he didn't do it. 
replied Gonzalo, and if he says so, that's good enough for me. Maybe not for a court, but it's good enough for anyone who knows him. I've heard him admit enough rotten things that other people wouldn't. Suppose I ask him myself, okay, said Trumbull. Did you take the stuff, Mr. Sand? Sand paused. His blue eyes flicked from face to face. Then he said, Gentlemen, I am telling the absolute truth. I did not take the cash or the bonds. Halstead passed his hand upward over his forehead as though trying to clear away doubts. Mr. Sand, he said, you seem to have a position of some trust. You can get into a safe with negotiable assets in it, yet you play the horses. Lots of people do. And lose. I didn't quite plan it that way. But don't you risk losing your job. My advantage, sir, is that I am employed by my uncle, who is aware of my weakness, but who also knows I don't lie. He knew I had the means and the opportunity to steal, and he knew I had debts. He also knew I had recently paid off my gambling debts. I told him so. Yet the circumstantial evidence against me looked bad. But then he asked me directly if I was responsible for the loss, and I told him exactly what I told you. I did not take the cash or the bonds. Since he knows me well, he believes me. How were you able to pay off your gambling debts, said Avalon? Because a long shot came through. That happens too sometimes. It happened shortly before the theft was discovered, and I paid off the bookies. But then you didn't have a motive, said Gonzalo. I can't say that. The theft may have been committed as long as two weeks before its discovery. No one looked in that particular drawer in the safe for that period of time, except the thief, of course. It could be argued that after I took the cash and bonds, the horse came through and made the theft unnecessary. Too late. It might also be argued, said Halstead, that you took the money in order to place a large bet on the horse. The bet wasn't that large, and I had other sources. But yes, it could also be argued that way. Trumbull broke in. But if you still have your job, as I suppose you do, and if your uncle isn't prosecuting you, as I assume he isn't, has he notified the police at all? No. He can absorb the loss, and he feels the police will only try to pin it on me. He knows that what I have told him is true. Then what's the problem, for God's sake? There's simply no one else who could have done it. My uncle can't think of any other way of accounting for the theft, nor for that matter can I. And as long as he can't see any alternative, there will always be a residuum of uneasiness, of suspicion in his mind. He will always keep his eye on me. He will always be reluctant to trust me. I'll keep my job, but I'll never be promoted, and I may be made uncomfortable enough to be forced to resign. If I do, I can't count on a wholehearted recommendation, and from an uncle, a half-hearted one would be ruinous. Reuben was frowning. So you came here, Mr. San, because Gonzalo said we solve mysteries. You want us to tell you who really took the stuff? San shrugged. Maybe not. I don't even know if I can give you enough information. It's not as though you're detectives who can go to the scene of the crime and make inquiries. If you could just tell me how it might have been done, even if it's far-fetched, that would help. If I could go to my uncle and say, Uncle, it might have been done this way, mightn't it? Even if he couldn't be sure, even if he couldn't ever get the money and bonds back, it would at least spread the suspicion. He wouldn't have the eternal nagging thought that I was the only possible thief. Well, said Avalon, we can try to be logical, I suppose. How about the other people who work with you and your uncle? Would any of them need money badly? Sand shook his head. Enough to risk the possible consequences of being caught? I don't know. One of them might be in debt, or one might be paying blackmail, or one might be greedy, or just have the opportunity and acted on impulse. If I were a detective, I could go about asking questions, or I could track down documents, or whatever it is they do. As it is, of course, said Avalon, we can't do that either. 
Now, you say you had both means and opportunity. Did anyone else have them? At least three people could have got into the safe more easily than I and got away with it more easily, but not one of them knew the combination, and the safe wasn't broken into. That's certain. There are two people besides my uncle and myself who know the combination, but one has been hospitalized over the entire period in question, and the other is such an old and reliable member of the firm that to suspect him seems unthinkable. Aha, said Mario Gonzalo, there's our man right there. You've been reading too many Agatha Christie's, said Reuben. The fact of the matter is that in almost every crime on record, the most suspicious person turns out to be the criminal. Well, that's beside the point, said Halstead, and too dull besides. What we have here is a pure exercise in logic. Let's have Mr. Sand tell us everything he knows about every member of the firm, and we can all try to see if there's any way in which we can work out motive, means, and opportunity for some other person. Oh, hell, said Trumbull. Who says it has to be one person? So someone's in a hospital. Big deal. The telephone exists. He phones the combination to a confederate. All right, all right, said Halstead hastily. We're bound to think up all sorts of possibilities, and some may be more plausible than others. After we've thrashed them out, Mr. Sand can choose the most plausible and tell it to his uncle. May I speak, sir? Henry spoke so quickly and at a sound level so much higher than his usual murmur that everyone turned to face him. Henry said this time softly, Although I'm not a black widower. Not so, said Reuben. You know you're a black widower. In fact, you're the only one who's never missed a single meeting. Then may I point out, gentlemen, that if Mr. Sand carries your conclusion, whatever it may be, to his uncle, he will be carrying the proceedings of this meeting beyond the walls of this room. There was an uncomfortable silence. Halstead said, in the interest of saving an innocent person's reputation, surely Henry shook his head gently. But it would be at the cost of spreading suspicion to one or more other people who might also be innocent. Avalon said, Henry's got something there. We seem to be stymied. Unless, said Henry, we can come to a definite conclusion that will satisfy the club and will not involve the outside world. What do you have in mind, Henry? asked Trumbull. If I may explain, I was, as Mr. Gonzalo said before dinner, interested to meet someone who never tells a lie. Now come, Henry, said Reuben. You're pathologically honest yourself. You know you are. That's been established more than once. That may be so, said Henry, but I do tell lies. Do you doubt, San? Do you think he's lying, said Reuben? I assure you, began Sand, almost in anguish. No, said Henry. I believe that every word Mr. Sand has said is true. He didn't take the money or the bonds. He's the logical one at whom suspicion points. His career may be ruined. His career, on the other hand, may not be ruined if some reasonable alternative explanation can be found, even if that does not actually lead to a solution. And, since he can think of no reasonable alternative himself, he wants us to help find one for him. I am convinced, gentlemen, that all this is true. San nodded. Well, thank you. And yet, said Henry, what is truth? For instance, Mr. Trumbull, I think that your habit of perpetually arriving late with a cry of scotch and soda for a dying man is rude, unnecessary, and worse yet, has grown boring. I suspect others here feel the same. Trumbull flushed, but Henry went on firmly. Yet if, under ordinary circumstances, I were asked whether I disapproved of it, I would say I did not. Strictly speaking, that would be a lie. But I like you for other reasons, Mr. Trumbull, that far outweigh this verbal trick of yours. So telling the strict truth, which would imply a dislike for you, would end up being a greater lie. Therefore I lie to express a truth. 
my liking for you. Trumbull muttered, I'm not sure I like your way of liking, Henry. Henry said, Or consider Mr. Halstead's limerick on the first book of the Iliad. Mr. Avalon quite rightly said that Achilles is the correct name of the hero, or even Achilles with a K, I suppose, to suggest the correct sound. But then Mr. Rubin pointed out that the truth would seem like a typographical error and spoil the effect of the limerick. Again, literal truth creates a problem. Mr. Sand said that all lies arise out of a desire for self-protection or out of respect for social conventions. But we cannot always ignore self-protection and social conventions. If we cannot lie, we must make the truth lie for us. Gonzalo said, You're not making sense, Henry. I think I am, Mr. Gonzalo. Few people listen to exact words, and many a literal truth tells a lie by implication. Who should know that better than a person who always tells the literal truth? Sand's pale cheeks were less pale, or his red tie was reflecting more color upward. He said, What the hell are you implying? I would like to ask you just one question, Mr. Sand, if the members of the club are willing, of course. I don't care if they are or not, said Sand, glowering at Henry. If you take that tone, I might not choose to answer. You may not have to, said Henry. The point is that each time you deny having committed the crime, you deny it in precisely the same words. I couldn't help but notice since I made up my mind to listen to your exact words as soon as I heard that you never lied. Each time you said, I did not take the cash or the bonds. And that is perfectly true, said Sand loudly. I'm sure it is, or you wouldn't have said so, said Henry. Now this is the question I would like to ask you. Did you, by any chance, take the cash and the bonds? There was a short silence.